science plays a vital role for economic development and societal well-being. Understanding this, the Academy of Sciences Malaysia was established with a mission to be Malaysia's thought leader in all areas of science, technology and innovation. To realize its mission, ASM harnesses the nation's top scientific minds to chart the STI direction and facilitates the implementation of an innovation-led economy for the country. ASM's commitment lies firmly in fostering a culture of excellence in STI in Malaysia. ASM does this by providing independent, credible, relevant and timely STI input of national and international importance to the country. Our network of expertise comprises Malaysian scientists, engineers and technologists who specialize in various disciplines. The Academy assists in upgrading the nation's technological capabilities in the industrial sectors by producing high-quality publications such as peer-reviewed journals, monographs and books. In addition, ASM also provides input on current and future technology trends to be considered and taken up by the government in driving the nation's economy forward. To provide Malaysian scientists with the best opportunities and exposure, ASM actively extends its international networks and collaborations. It currently has a range of multilateral engagements with renowned scientific institutions worldwide. The Academy also champions the need to grow the right talent in STI by cultivating interests in science, technology, engineering and mathematics to the younger generation. In short, the Academy's ethos is broadly defined as Think Science, Celebrate Technology, Inspire Innovation.
science plays a vital role for economic development and societal well-being. Understanding this, the Academy of Sciences Malaysia was established with a mission to be Malaysia's thought leader in all areas of science, technology and innovation. To realize its mission, ASM harnesses the nation's top scientific minds to chart the STI direction and facilitates the implementation of an innovation-led economy for the country. ASM's commitment lies firmly in fostering a culture of excellence in STI in Malaysia. ASM does this by providing independent, credible, relevant and timely STI input of national and international importance to the country. Our network of expertise comprises Malaysian scientists, engineers and technologists who specialize in various disciplines. The Academy assists in upgrading the nation's technological capabilities in the industrial sectors by producing high-quality publications such as peer-reviewed journals, monographs and books. In addition, ASM also provides input on current and future technology trends to be considered and taken up by the government in driving the nation's economy forward. To provide Malaysian scientists with the best opportunities and exposure, ASM actively extends its international networks and collaborations. It currently has a range of multilateral engagements with renowned scientific institutions worldwide. The Academy also champions the need to grow the right talent in STI by cultivating interests in science, technology, engineering and mathematics to the younger generation. In short, the Academy's ethos is broadly defined as Think Science, Celebrate Technology, Inspire Innovation. Okay. Um, good. Good evening uh, to those in, in this um, this part of the world, um, and good afternoon to those who are on the other side of the tropical belt. My name is uh, Dr. Rizal Ayri Ahmad. Um, I'm attached to the organization called Nano Malaysia Berhad, a government agency looking into the commercialization of nanotech. It brings me great pleasure um, as a moderator with the presence of the uh, respected and esteemed uh, panel speakers. Um, representing um, the Philippines, um, Indonesia, Nigeria, and um, Malaysia itself. So the, the title of the, of the session today <clears throat> is Leading Age Material Development for the Tropics. So that would be the context and the pretext, and it carries a certain mission statement. So the whole idea and the whole context of this session today is to, uh, to rediscover, to, to mine and to, to look into what are the key factors for us to, to for the tropical, the countries and economies in the tropical belt to rediscover their economic growth potential to ensure that some of the, or all of the raw materials uh, and the uh, natural resources that, that can be found in, in these tropical belts can, can be retained and can be converted into high value application. So the new wave uh, in chemistry and material sciences is bringing to, to the marketplace new innovative materials huh, that can be designed for tropical conditions and at the same time it can be also resilient against uh, changing climate conditions. So this next generation of high performing materials will also help to accelerate 
unique architectural engineering designs, solutions, and even going into high value applications, which will carry the or the response towards some of those uh, revolutionary mega trends that we are witnessing today, such as renewable energy, electro electric vehicles, so on and so forth. So the tropics is typically uh, a traditionally rich uh, in high value natural resources and materials. So how can the question here today um, to be to be to be res responded and to be discussed by our esteemed panel speakers here? How can we actually retain the conversion of these raw materials, um, whether it is processed as a byproduct or occurring naturally, so that we can retain it in the in the tropics to ensure that the economies in the tropical belt will be able to have this possession of downstream application to ensure that we are able to have a high level of ownership strategically to ensure that we have that that um, value chain re-established in the country so that we have greater control of our economic trajectory moving forward. So without much further ado, I would I'd like to bring you to the, the first speaker of today. Um, the, sp the first speaker will bring us into uh, the topic called innovating high value biomass based advanced materials. Uh, a bit of background uh, on the speaker, uh, namely Dr. Annabel Librionis. Dr. Annabelle is currently the Director of Industrial Technology Development Institute, ITDI, Department of Science and Technology, DOST. She is uh, at the forefront of leading the Institute to make local industries globally competitive through research and development, transfer and commercialization of innovative and sustainable technologies, and appropriate technical services. She earned her doctorate in engineering from Keio University, Japan, and a Master of Science in Chemistry from the University of Santo Tomas, Philippines, in 2017, she had been conferred Scientist uh, 1 of Scientific uh, Career System by the Philippines National Academy of Science and Technology and the CESO number 4 rank by the Career Executive Service Board. She had represented the country in various international symposia and conferences. She has authored multiple publications and patents, and one of her research is the Philippine Mosquito Ovicidal Larvicidal Trap system selected as finalists of the, 20, of the 2016 R&D 100 Awards, the Oscars of Invention. She also received the award as Woman Leader of the USD in 2019 and a recipient of the Presidential Lincoln Bayan Award Group Category 2014. In 2020, the Philippine Association for the Advancement of Science and Technology bested her with the Gregorio Zara Award for Applied Research, and this year. Asian Scientist Magazine recognized her accomplishment as one of the most outstanding scientists in the region in the 2021 edition of the Asian Scientist 100 Days. So over to you, Dr. Annabel. We would definitely love to hear from the Philippines perspective in how we can achieve our mission here, our vision and mission to ensure that the tropical belt economies are able to have high level of, of possession and ownership towards the conversion of, of raw materials to ensure that we are able to sustain our growth collaboratively. Over to you, Dr. Annabel. Thank you, Dr. Rezal. Uh, distinguished panelists, participants, and esteemed guests, good evening and good afternoon. So my topic for tonight is innovating high-value biomass-based advanced materials. Next. Biomass includes any organic matter that is available on a renewable or recurring basis. It comes from a various various sources like wood from natural forests and woodlands, forest replantation and residues, agricultural residues such as straw, cane trash and green agricultural waste. And for agro-industrial waste, it includes sugar cane bagasse, uh, rice husk, animal waste, industrial waste, seaweed, municipal solid waste and food processing waste. And biomass is an expensive renewable resource and is seen as a sustainable feedstock to reduce overall environmental impact. Next. So let me share to you the study done by uh, University of Bologna, Italy, and the Fraunhofer ISI Germany as part of a consortium led by COVAS under the framework of the Biospray Tender Study in support to research and innovation policy in the area of bio-based products. So I've, I've as you have seen here in the table, 
these are the top 20 most promising bio-based products under natural rubber, vegetable fibers, renewable oils and fats, lignin, terpenes, polyelectrolytes, and urban bio-waste. So with this, the biomass category uh, at the right side, there's the top 20 most promising bio-based. So the outcome of selecting the top 20 uh, bio-based products reveals important information on the general trends in the bio-based industry. First, the most significant attention is on the industrial development of new bio-based materials targeted at advanced technical applications. So engineering materials with elevated thermal uh, mechanical properties suitable for the automotive and construction fields such as biopolyester, -poly biopolyamides, matrices, and fillers for reinforced biocomposites, but also biolubricants represents the vast uh, majority of the top 20 innovative bio-based products. Next slide. So as shown here, uh, I just pick up uh, the top natural resources in the Philippines as based on the, uh, uh, the downstream uh, products that could be uh, developed. So we have the abaca. The Philippines remain as the world's leading abaca producer exports of abaca fiber and manufacture generated an average of 97.1 million US dollars per year in the last 10 years. And some 84.9 million came from uh, abaca manufacturers such as pulp, cordage, yarns, fabrics, and fiber crops. And the remaining 12.2 million comes from the raw fiber exports. So as we all know, Abaca is rich in natural fibers and it is used as for biomaterials as high potential to substitute glass fibers in multiple automotive parts and is currently recognized as a material for paper products. We also have a, uh, aside from the uh, uses of the abaca uh, in making ropes, twines, uh, fishing lines, nets, and coarse cloth for sucking, there is also a flourishing niche market for abaca clothing, curtains, screens, and furnishings. But paper making is currently the primary use of fiber. And we have also the natural rubber. Uh, in 2020, uh, the volume of rubber produced in the Philippines amounted to approximately 422.4 thousand metric tons. Although we are not the top producer of the uh, rubber. Uh, in, in, in Asia. So the Philippines was seventh in global natural rubber production in 2017. So we know that uh, the rubber, uh, the product would be the tire, which is the major product, and it accounts for 72% 70 70 of the global demand. And tires are used in large bicycles, motorcycles, automotive air aircraft, and trucks. And for non-tire uh, applications, these are the hose, the belts, uh, registered 8% shear, followed by the gloves with 6%, thread and foam with 2%, and the general uh, rubber goods with 2%, and other non-tire products with 1% shear. So based on the industrial rubber market, global industry analysis, and opportunity assessment, from 2015 to 2025, the global industrial rubber market is expected to boost demand due to the growing uh, automotive industry, rising construction output, includes roads, uh, bridges, uh, buildings, and race trucks, to name a few, and manufacturing activities. Next, I also include here the coconut. Uh, the Philippines is the world's second largest producer of coconut products after Indonesia. And we all know that coconut oil and crude coconut oil remain among the top three products. Uh, this is being imported by U.S. from the Philippines for three consecutive years. So the Philippines supply 60% of U.S. imports of coconut oil and 73% of crude coconut oil. And then we have the seaweed also. So I put it there as the uh, one of the uh, up biomass uh, resources in the Philippines. And here, uh, I also shared in this table a study by Maumau Ton et al. 2019 from the University of Strabag. 
So the Philippines has significant and abundant biomass resources, including agricultural crop residues, forest residues, animal waste, ag agro-industrial waste, municipal solid waste, and aquatic biomass. So as the energy needs of the Philippines rely predominantly on the import of fossil fuels, the government has looked at renewable energy for possible uh, alternatives. So nearly 30% of the energy for the 100 million people plus living in the Philippines comes from biomass and is mainly used for household cooking by the rural production. So additionally, the biomass industry is rapidly advancing uh, with 277 uh, megawatt of installed uh, capacity around the country. Next slide. So I am also going to share with you uh, a UNESCO science report in 2021. Uh, the Race Against Time for Smarter Development published in 2021 presented a heat map showing the change in scientific publishing from 2012 to 2019 on 56 topics related to the sustainable development goals. So summarized in this slide are the top topics that show growth in output among the tropical countries. This topic can be taken as an indicator of the research trends and priorities in the region. So the top research uh, topics for the SDG is goal number six, the wastewater, the clean water and sanitation. And then we have the SD, uh, SDG 7, affordable and clean energy, and the SDG 9, industry innovation and infrastructure. Next slide. So for the clean water and sanitation, we have the wastewater treatment and reuse. So this make use of the biomass the base pol polymers as being used as materials for the remo uh, removal of heavy metals from an aqueous environment. Some important biomass monomers are being transformed into micro or nano capsules for this purpose. Next slide. We have also the uh, SD, SDG 7, affordable and clean energy. So biomass also plays a significant role in the development of biofuels. It can be transformed into clean energy and fuels by various technologies, reducing overall biomass waste quantities, the greenhouse gas emission, and dependence on fossil fuel-based power plants. And uh, we all we we know that there are already large commercial-scale biofuel production from my, microalgae using genetic engineering is also being pursued as one of the research trends. And there is also increasing literature on biofuel plants found in the tropics as alternative fuel sources and tools for better environmental management. Next slide. So SDG 9 for the industry, innovation, and infrastructure uh, that uh, give importance to biomass in construction. So aside from biofuel, biosource materials, as materials as also are also gaining importance in the construction industry. So some experts uh, on construction shared that biomass-based or biosource construction materials play an essential role in the tropics because they limit the building's environmental footprint due to their renewable nature, uh, ability to store atmospheric carbon and their low gray uh, energy. The gray energy refers to the total energy consumed throughout the product's life cycle from production to disposal. And then we have the hybrid wood substitute composite. It is one of the common uses of biomass in fabricating composite panels from natural fibers and polymers as eco in construction materials. And biomass is also a source of green reagents for industrial processes such as beneficiation of ores, uh, minerals and coal. Next slide. And then uh, we also have uh, some examples of the biomass based uh, biosource materials that can also be found in the tropics. Uh, these are the bagas, a fibrous residue of sugarcane, can be used as a vegetable concrete, many considered also bamboo, as the future building material can be rapidly renewed with low consumption, consumption energy and has interesting mechanical properties. 
and we also have a typha, a harmful and invasive plant common in West Africa, but can be used as a building material with insulating properties and as a raw material for energy production. Okay, Annabelle, your, your time is up, yeah? Okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> You may you may um, uh, proceed to your closing uh, slide if you, you if you wish. Okay, so can we next 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 next? Okay. So and so uh, back back please. <laughs> so in summary, uh, in uh, in the tropics have a rich source of biomass that can be further explored to develop sustainable materials that can help address the needs of the region. Residues waste can still be transformed into resources for the development of value-added products that are cost-effective and environmentally uh, sustainable. And then aside from developing new technologies for industry, we also hope to inspire innovation even among the private sector. And generally, uh -huh. through this presentation, we agree that there is indeed a need for high-value conversion of indigenous materials because they can positively influence the local economy. So it's not just for the raw materials, but we have really to go into the downstream of the products for for each country to, to develop their economy, uh, natural-based uh, uh, industries, the uh, economy. And the uh, next slide, and, uh, please collaborate with us. And uh, we have many international partners in our research, and we are also partnering with international uh, uh, institutions. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Annabelle. Uh, very interesting presentation, and well appreciated at the fact that you punctuated your presentation with that exclamation of the need for us to go further downstream creating high value application for, for especially for biomass which is the, the center the, which is the central theme of your presentation um we shall go we shall revisit uh, revisit your, your presentation during the Q&A session because i, I think i have a, a lots and lots of, of, of queries and comments to be made so that we can arrive to the to the our vision and mission statement of the session i.e to ensure that Countries like the Philippines and the rest of us are able to to master our own uh, so-called economic uh, destiny, so that we can go into higher and higher and higher value activities. So with with that, this would uh, allow me to to transition to the next speaker, uh, Professor Dr. Nuro Taufiku. Allow me to to give a, a brief uh, background of his illustrious career. Dr. Nuro Taufiku. Rahman is a scientist who is passionate about things moving at the smallest matter where possibilities are endless. Something that is strange and unfamiliar to most people, nanotechnology has always been Dr. Nuru's obsession in life. So we, we do share that in common, uh, Pat Nuru. <laughs> at the age of 40, he owns over 10 patents and copyrights, both here in Indonesia and Japan. He has won 17 awards, including the Best Innovation and the Best Idea in Business Award from SWA Magazine 2005 and the best young scientist from the Indonesian Institute of Sciences, LIPI, in 2004. He wrote 62 research papers for international publication and is currently the chairman of the Indonesian Society for Nanos in 2005. After years being in Japan for working and doing undergraduate and graduate and PhD studies on material science and production engineering, Dr. Nurul felt the calling of returning to his home country and contribute to Indonesia development while holding the belief that Nanotechnology is the key to unlocking the nation's rich treasure and bright future. Passion for innovation, driven national development, and strong faith in nation became uh, the driving force of his continued research practices and dissemination of knowledge in the field of nanotechnology. So, with that, um, over to you, uh, Panuro, from lab to industry, uh, from your perspective in terms of how we can empower uh, our respective economies to go into high value activities. You may start now, Panuro. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Rizal. Uh, good evening, everybody. It is an honor to me to have an opportunity to talk about our little bit experience on nanotechnology development in Indonesia and its commercialization based on Indonesian natural resources from lab to the industry. Next, please. Okay, uh, scientists deem that in the future, uh, near future, they can create robotics, white blood cells, swim through the circulatory system of the human body ingesting and destroying pathogenic agents such as harmful bacteria, virus, and insecti. 
Next, please. Well, a nano is a dimension of a nanometer. One nanometer equals one per one billion meters. Very, very small. Next, please. The definition of uh, nanotechnology, all of us know, is the ability to understand, control, and manipulate matter at the level of individual atoms or molecules, as well as at the supramolecular level, including clusters of molecules. Its goal is to create materials, devices, and systems with essentially new properties and function because of their small structure. Next, please. Nowadays, uh, many nanotechnology-based customer products are already on the market in Indonesia. Food supplements, sport equipment, our shoes, clothes, uh, computers, electronics, cream, cosmetics, and directly. And over 2000, about 10, uh, maybe 3000 customer products based on nanotechnology are already available in, our, in the market in, in the world. Next, please. Moreover, it is also predicted that nanotechnology can lead to the fifth industrial revolution. We say that nanotech revolution will give significant social impact that equal to four previous industrial revolution in relatively short period. Next, please. Well, uh, talking about our country, Indonesia is blessed with abundance of natural resources, including its biodiversity, the second greatest after Brazil. This may be used as raw materials for nano-based products. And we are the third most populated country in the Asia and fourth in the world with around two, uh, 200, uh, now seven, 70 million people. And this is a big and potential market. Next, please. Recently, research on medical plants has attracted a lot of attention globally. And medical plants will seemingly continue to play an important role as a health aid. Next, please. Why do we need uh, nanotechnology in traditional medicine? Because first, there is a limitation in uh, traditional technology to extract such as herbal materials. So we need nanoprocessing technology. Second, since traditional extract method may use a toxic solvent, uh, the use of amounts of those are limited. Therefore, we need nanoprocessing technology. In delivery system, there are some limited limitation of using traditional medicine such as the herbal drugs may get deteriorated in the acidic pH of the stomach and also low solubility and bioavailability. Therefore, need nanocarrier technology and so on. Next, please. Researcher from Taiwan, Liu et al., uh, reported that nanotechnology can increase active constituent amount uh, significantly during extraction. Next, please. Nanotechnology can be used as a novel drug delivery system because of the unique size of nanoscale particles that enhance the entire of surface area on the drug, allocating quicker dissolution in the blood, on and so on. Yeah. Next, please. Experts have predicted the very significant increase in the optimistic global value for nanomaterials to reach more than 14 Point seven billion US dollar in uh, 2015 and will rise exponentially to reach about 55 US uh, dollar billion in 2020. Uh, for example, if we can be the producer of nanoparticles, we can benefit a lot. Just reducing the size of the particles into nano has increased the value significantly. Ceramic nanoparticle is about one to thousand US dollar per kilogram metal nanoparticle is about 10 to 10000 us dollar per kilogram how about herbal nanoparticles that we have this increase 10 or 100 even a thousand times much higher than raw materials without nanotechnology process and the consumption tend to increase by time next please well, now let's talking about the technology, nanotechnology impact in our natural resources. Nanotechnology give a significant impact for our agricultural raw material. This curcuma only 2,000 rupiah per kilogram in the traditional market. However, we can significantly increase its value to be about 500 times or about 1 million rupiah per kilogram while it becomes curcuma nanoparticle for cosmetic or for traditional medicine. Next, please. Using nanotechnology, ginger powder nanoparticles can dissolve to the water up to 100% without remaining materials, showing you how the great effect of nanotechnology on herbal product. Next, please. This is also the great impact of nanotechnology. The mangoes 
a thin rain extract nanoparticles can be used as herbal tea with high antioxidant and therefore can increase the added value up to 2 million rupiah per kilogram next please well here is the chitosan nanoparticles from a stream cell we can change the unvalued viscerous uh, waste to become a raw material for high quality of cosmetic and medicine product it can be used for anti-aging sunscreen wound healing drug delivery antibacterial and so on next please nanotechnology we also can add significant value for our other agriculture product such as avocado cucumber and so on by nanotechnology to be extracted and to be used for many things for soap medicine cosmetic and food supplement product and so on next please the value of nanotechnology can be illustrated as follow a farmer of curcuma need to produce one ton curcuma to buy a super slim laptop but i can get that laptop with only five kilogram nano powder of curcuma that i produce from less than one uh, seven kilogram dried curcuma that cost me only seventy thousand rupiah so i can buy a um, 10 million rupiah laptop with only seventy thousand rupiah next please this mobile phone can be purchased maybe about two, uh, two million rupiah where I can buy that also with only one kilogram of mangosteen rain nanoparticles. Ladies and gentlemen, we may use curcuma or mangosteen rain nanoparticles containing cream for your beauty care two or three times uh, a day. Then you have to buy this product anytime. Well, how often do you buy a laptop or handphone once in two or three years? To make this super slim laptop or mobile phone, you may need to invest trillion of rupiah. To reap similar value added, you only need to give me billion of rupiah to produce nanoparticles of curcuma. With this illustration, then we Indonesia will choose which one. Establishing a laptop factory, which may we not win competing with other country, or pushing the establishment of herbal factory with high value added. Next, please. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the nano tsunami is gaining height. We have to prepare before we got swap our offer. Next, please. Uh, for your information, the player of nanotechnology is not genetic uh, industries, but small and startup company that spun off from uh, university or research center. Because the barrier entry of nanotechnology business is the technology itself, not about capital or money. Let's join hand in hand to develop this nanotechnology industry and business for our prosperity based on our very rich natural resources. Next, please. Finally, last but not least, I will uh, talk about nano center industry activity in applying the uh, nano uh, technology. Uh, please, next. Uh, this is just our uh, achievement uh, pattern. We have uh, 42. Next, please. And maybe you can make our many activity in media. Next, please. And this one the media okay next please uh d we have got many uh, award next please uh next sorry next the we get uh, wipo uh, this is uh, the here the founder of nano tech is global and here the key metrics we now uh, 10 10 startup now nah. uh, we got uh, this uh, uh, 42 patent uh, next please uh, next, please. Uh, this is our uh, nano herbal office head office, and we also have factory herbal factory. Next, please. Uh, more than fifty product based on nanotechnology is already in the market. Uh, this is the best product. Next, please. Uh, that's the product. Next, this is uh, propolis nanoparticle, sunpro nanoparticle. Next, please. Next, and uh, this is from uh, yes, uh, uh, nano ketosan. Next, please. This is for. Uh, skincare, next please, from Mangustin, next please. This is Nano Gold Particle, uh, cholesterol herbal drinks, next please. Uh, and this is, you can see Nano Silver uh, in detergent, our product, next please. And many product, new product, next please. Uh, next, uh, baby series, next. Uh, then others, this is also, we are the startup uh, get uh, the winner in uh, in many uh, competition in Indonesia, Grab and uh, Bank Mandiri in uh, our uh, startup. Next, please. This is our partner. Next, please. So, finally, uh, conclusion, Indonesia has abundant natural resources to be processed. 
uh, using nanotechnology for many industrial application increases at value. Nanotechnology will re revolutionize many sectors, including agriculture and replace current technology. Indonesia should take advantage of this nanotechnology to uplift the competitive of Indonesia to echo to other advanced country in uh, destructive era. Next, finally. How to uh, nanotechnology transfer from lab to industry requirement? So we need uh, knowledge workers, researchers, create research, research result, invention, uh, researcher with entrepreneurial attitude, and the strategy is making a startup company collaboration with R&D center and industry. So conditions close interaction among research industries uh, may be very, very important. Next. And uh, this without nanotechnology, then next. With nanotechnology, we are in, the, in front of uh, next. Next, please. Next, yes, this is with nanotechnology. We are yeah. in the okay, thank, you. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thank, you. Okay. thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Panurul. Huh? Um, I find it very, um, very refreshing to see that uh, being a fellow nanotech player and looking from an Indonesia perspective, huh? uh, looking at the traditional catalog of, of foods and natural resources that Indonesia has to offer. And this is a, a prime example of how with the incorporation of technology, but in this particular case, nanotech, you're able to convert, you know, that's something which is, seems to be abundance around us that we take for granted yeah, as food and whatnot can be converted into high value application, which is closer to and very intimate to us in, in the form of cosmetics, in the form of personal healthcare products, in terms of advanced nutritional uh, solutions uh, to improve our lives. Whereas the previous presentation by Dr. Annabelle looking at uh, things that, that helps us to improve as a, as a nation in terms of uh, achieving uh, sustainable development goals set by, by, by United Nations as such. So by, by looking at these two aspects of how uh, technology intervention and understanding of how we can push this raw material from biomass, from the previous presentation, from the pre-existing food ecosystem and how we can push it into uh, uh, push the boundaries of application for personal care, healthcare solutions. So this already provide at least two facets of how we can push the agenda to ensure that the tropical uh, belt economies or countries is able to pursue you know, high value activities beyond what it is, beyond the obvious, so to speak. So thank you so much for that. We'll come back to that and how we can see how we can move this agenda forward. By, by ensuring that how this economy can work together collaboratively. Uh, which brings me to, to the next presenter. I think um, Mr. Eugene Lau, I think you have to, uh, your session is not being pushed up to, uh, uh, to, to, to as the next presenter. So uh, let, allow me to, to present uh, Mr. Eugene Lau. Uh, he's an architect who has uh, practiced in England, Malaysia and Australia for more than 30 years. And over the last seven years, uh, Eugene has refocused and committed his work towards bamboo design. So we're looking at a very focused president on bamboo, building and teaching. He joined Ibuku in 2015 as lead architect and worked with the Ibuku team to create many of the bamboo buildings in Green School, Green Village, uh, Bali and Ibuku's project internationally. He has also been actively promoting bamboo via talks, workshops in bamboo in Bali since 2016 and over the last three years, further advocating bamboo and architectural design, teaching and mentoring within organizations and universities in Southeast Asia. In 2018, uh, Eugene started on his own bamboo journey further, widening his experience and network in bamboo by delivering projects through 1010 Design, his architectural practice that operates in Australia and the Asia-Pacific Asia region. At the start of the 2020 COVID pandemic, Eugene returned from Bali to Melbourne and during the lockdowns, he started a bamboo uh, Instagram account, Better Bamboo Buildings, as a bamboo building design platform. He subsequently launched a blog, Better Bamboo Buildings, sharing design information and insights that subsequently developed into a bamboo building design course and learning resource. Eugene is currently working on bamboo building project in Southeast Asia and writing a book on bamboo architecture to be published in early 2022. So over to you, Mr. Eugene. I would love to hear uh, the potential of bamboo, uh, especially in the, in, in, in the context of Malaysia, but of course, uh, across the tropical belt. Thank you. Over Thank you, you. Robert. Well, next, please. Bamboo, as we know, um, is always referred to, has been always referred to as a poor man's material. Um, we see pictures like these where buildings rot quickly, 
And bamboo, if not treated well, and if it's exposed, will develop fungus, will get eaten by insects, and will rot. Next, please. When we look at bamboo, it is really an, a re-emerging material, especially when we compare it to steel, to timber, to concrete. Bamboo is really the new kid on the block. Um, it is just starting. Um, it has always been with us traditionally, but in today's world, uh, we are beginning to see bamboo grow in these different contexts. Next, please. There are more than 16,000 species of bamboo in the world. And if you can look at the purple area, bamboo thrives in the tropics. There is abundance of bamboo. There's a lot of it. It is regenerative. It is fast growing. It is also renewable. Next, please. Bamboo is lightweight, easy to handle. One person can work with a pole and you don't need cranes, you don't need big trucks. It can be easily moved around. Next slide, please. Of course, bamboo keeps soil together. It replenishes dilapidated soil. It gathers water a lot. It, it grabs water. But more importantly nowadays, it sequesters carbon a lot more than timber, kilogram for kilogram. It outputs oxygen also more than timber um, when compared to a tree, say. Next, please. With bamboo, the two ends of it is that at, on the village end, we can see it uplifting communities, uh, providing economy, providing business. And on the other end, when we think about harvesting it responsibly, growing it and then producing it as well. It provides uh, a lot of business and value. Next, please. Bamboo as a full calm pole, if you like, is an interesting material. It is a pipe. It is a pipe with different sections and with vascular bundles. Imagine these fibers going through this pipe. The fibers are more dense on the outside with a silica layer, as you can see there. And as it grows towards the center, it is more spongy, if you like. And in each section, there's what you call a diaphragm on the inside, and the outside is called the node. Next, please. In today's bamboo world, we have managed to figure out how to treat bamboo, right? There are many ways now. Uh, applicable to different levels, but bamboo is now able to be grown, harvested and treated responsibly, ethically, so that we have the material that we can use, especially in construction, where we, it can be relied that it is not going to be eaten by termites, it's not going to rot, provided we design it properly. Next, please. Also, methods of joining bamboo, the joints in bamboo construction are critical. So new methods, uh, new and improved methods are, are also being combined with traditional methods to produce uh, more strong joints uh, that are applicable in buildings in, let's say, wind-prone areas and earthquake areas. Next, please. From a bamboo pole itself, you can see that it can be then divided, split into two, split into further splits, if you like, made into rods, made into slivers, and then bundled, and uh, traditionally bundled, put together, and, all, and combined to be able to then bring you a range of building materials that can be applied. Next. Bamboo can also be as I've said, made into splits, made into small pieces, and then process. You can see various applications of bamboo being turned into beams. Beams not only in a straight form, 
right? With bamboo construction, we can find that bamboo can, can be bent, can be curved to produce really beautiful buildings, which I will show you in a minute. Very much different to the nuances of timber or steel, where we are talking about right angles, we're talking about boxing and structure, whereas in bamboo construction and building, we are talking about curves. We're talking about how, how different it is, um, how more or less, bam, bam, how bamboo can lead the way to be different from steel and timber. Next, please. And as we develop, bamboo can be broken down. It can be compressed. Uh, the, the actual fibers can be taken out and then reconstituted uh, to form much stronger material, right? It can be also laminated, can be compressed, and this is becoming, we are now coming to the field of engineered bamboo, where there is a lot happening here and beams, columns uh, are being developed that are strong enough and also even up to the point of uh, aircraft industry as well, where laminated bamboo uh, is coming in. Next. Uh, the, the field which I work in a lot more is, is, is in design and construction where in today's world we are seeing more and more bamboo all over Southeast Asia, South America and many other countries as well being applied and it is almost substituting timber in some cases and here in this slide you can see uh, going clockwise from the left would be uh, framing, house framing in the Philippines, and then uh, top right would be more like portal framing, portal framing in, in Indonesia, and then bottom right would be deployable, a deployable building in terms of portal frame in Brazil, and then the last one, bottom left would be stilt housing in flat prone India very much uh, lower applications, but still that is now increasing. The use of bamboo is increasing. The interest in bamboo is increasing. Next, please. We then go into much higher end bamboo where you will see this in the press in Vietnam, in Thailand, and also in South America. The use of bamboo for more prominent buildings, more high-end buildings is increasing, is gaining prominence in the ecological field, in the green field. Next. No, oh, yeah, and yeah, uh, just back again, please. Yeah, these are some of the more recent ones in Beijing, in, in, in Guangzhou, in uh, Vietnam, and in Mexico. Bamboo is, is being noticed and how far can we go? We shall see. Next one. So yeah, thank you. Uh, short and sweet. Please visit me at Better Bamboo Buildings. Thanks very much. Wow. I must say I'm, I'm utterly impressed with this. <laughs> I've never seen bamboo being used in such majestic way. Especially those, those uh, the, the few, uh, the last few images that you have shared. I mean, wow, it's so mind blowing. Because typically, when when you talk about bamboo, what conjures uh, it conjures an image of you know the traditional way of doing things like small architectural, uh, you know, designs like uh, villages. It doesn't even go beyond you know uh, ten or twenty feet range. But this is like wow, we're talking about a super akin to a superstructure which can can literally uh, accommodate uh, many many people uh, congregations conferences conventions and whatnot and i'm also uh, taken aback by the fact that bamboo compared to timber trees um, uh, have um, you know a certain advantages uh, in terms of holding soil together and producing oxygen i think that wow, wow that, that's that's <laughs> quite mind-blowing i must say <laughs> Ah, interesting, interesting. Um, 
So that that brings us to uh, I'm not so sure whether um, the the replacement for uh, Professor Muhammad Sani is is on board yet, but uh, to keep the momentum going as such, I think we can while we wait for for that repla uh, the replacement to come on board. I think it's only fair for us to 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 move uh, the agenda forward without any kind of a awkwardness in terms of having a <laughs> a, a gap of silence. Um, I think uh, we we jump into the Q and A and and open forum discussion as such. I think um, to start the ball rolling, we uh, um, there, there are certain pertinent questions which uh, I think that we we would like to see. I mean, overall, the, the session started with Dr. Annabelle presenting the potential of biomass, where it can where it came from, uh, how we can with the current initiative undertaken by the Philippines uh, going into energy based applications. Uh, Looking at the calorie value, and we have Professor uh, Nurul Taufik uh, looking at into the healthcare solution using nanotechnology to add value, uh, stemming from the food industry. And the last presentation uh, by Mr. Eugene looking at this quite mind blowing application, something which is simple, but the impact to the to the local economy can be tremendous as such. Um, I would like to start in a reverse order, um, having this fee flow session as such. Huh? Um, I'm starting with the with the, uh, the last presentation, uh, especially for Mr. Eugene. Bamboo, uh, um, since um, my mind is blown uh, by, by, by the, the last few images that you have shared. Uh, bamboo in itself, uh, if you were to look uh, beyond architectural, uh, based on what I know of bamboo properties, it has uh, a certain level of antimicrobial properties, those bamboo fibers as such. Um, and, and imagine if uh, uh, the, the things that we are able to do, especially at the current COVID-19 pandemic, uh, having those, uh, those uh, uh, so-called bamboo fibers exposed to environment on surfaces, which will also potentially assist uh, for us to, to arrest uh, the transmission of the COVID-19 virus as such. Uh, how do you foresee that opportunity um, incorporated into your, your bamboo agenda? Mr. Yujin, yeah. I think um, as a humble architect, not a scientist, it's a bit hard yeah. to give you a direct answer. Um, yeah. I will answer it this way in that um, I think bamboo having a really strong restart now, getting a lot of attention, um, mm -hmm. will be moving in many avenues, uh, many research areas and many products coming out of it not just your, your weaving, your mats, your buildings, but I think what you've mentioned before, in the medical fields, um, there's may, there will be many options and avenues open uh, mm -hmm. for bamboo to shine in that respect. Mm -hmm. Okay, right, right, right. interesting. Because okay, so, I mean, based on my, my, my personal background, looking into you know, fibers and breaking it down to nanofibers, uh, which o opens up, you know, a plethora of new dimensions and, and possibilities of which something which is very simple as bamboo for, for you know, macro structures for buildings and whatnot. When you go down, moving into molecular atomic level, uh, you're able to provide new opportunities uh, for textile, antimicrobial textile. And when you, you drill it down further into the, at the nano scale, it opens up another array of opportunities where the fiber in itself can go into broken down into nanocellulose, nanofiber. We can can also go into some of the key applications, which uh, I believe that Dr. Annabelle has touched on in terms of uh, you know uh, composites, you know even even concrete applications and other 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 form applications as such. I believe now um, to keep the the the, the motion fluid, um, we have um, Dr. Mohammad Harisani's uh, replacement. Um, are you on board now, sir? Are you able to present on behalf of uh, Professor Mohammed? Can you uh, unmute your mic so that we have audio? Oh. Thank you. Can, can, can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah. Oh, good afternoon, um, everybody. My name is uh, Engineer Emmanuel Ajani. Um, I'm a Deputy Director under the under Professor M.S. Aruna. Um, 
I would like to start by apologizing on his behalf. Um, there's a program at the National Assembly. It was supposed to have uh, rounded up, but um, of course, you know how politicians are. Uh, so it's a bit delayed and you can't get out. So I'll be making this presentation uh, quickly on NPR. I, okay. Uh, you have, uh, Mr. Emmanuel, you have uh, 10 minutes uh, to present on behalf of Professor Mohammed. So uh, I believe I shall hand, uh, hand over the floor, the virtual floor to you. Okay, okay. okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So um, the topic, um, localizing and diversifying uh, the downstream, downstream mining uh, output for sustainable economic growth, uh, a presentation by Engineer Professor Mohamed Sani Aruna, uh, the Executive Vice Chairman of uh, Naseni in Nigeria. Next slide, please. Uh, so um, the purpose of this presentation is um, to achieve sustainable economic growth, uh, raw materials of uh, resource-rich uh, developing countries uh, should be processed domestically rather than being exported in their own processed form. Um, we, uh, most of us are into materials. Uh, we know that uh, once you add value to uh, raw materials, the, the output and profit to the local co companies sometimes is uh, many folds more than the price of the actual raw materials. And um, some of the measures and policies that are in place uh, in Nigeria, especially that can incentivize uh, downstream beneficiation of uh, resource rich developing countries will be discussed. Next slide. Um, in several cases, uh, some of these policies, uh, uh, even in Nigeria where we have these policies, uh, they are not usually uh, done properly. Uh, what we have, even in Nigeria, uh, if, you, if you have been following up uh, the cases of things happening in the northern part of Nigeria, where bandits and all are, are all scrambling for the gold, none of them is thinking of uh, beneficiation. None of them is thinking of um, adding value to it, and they are selling it at ridiculous prices and Nigeria is suffering from Next slide, please. Um, if you look at uh, the population growth of Nigeria, uh, Nigeria is already above 200 million. And uh, on the next slide, which we'll see, the percentage that the downstream mining sector is adding to Nigeria's GDP is almost nothing. But we know that if we add uh, value to all those raw materials, all those natural raw materials that uh, are being produced or extracted in Nigeria, it will actually add a lot more. Can I, next slide, please. Um, it, uh, it's a bit tiny, but, but let's look at the next slide to see the actual amount of that um, solid minerals, you can see uh, on that blue block, um, solid mineral is just adding um, in the first quarter of year 2019, barely 12,000, which is less than 1% of the total GDP. Next slide. In Nigeria, uh, you also see in the next slide that there are quite so many um, solid minerals that um, Nigeria can actually benefit from, which if we add uh, value to, we have over 44, 44 mineral deposits in over 50, 500 locations across the 36 uh, states of uh, Nigeria, including the federal capital territory. You have the gold, the barite, bentonite, limestone, coal, bitumen, iron ore. Um, to mention iron ore, um, the iron industry in Nigeria would have been, would have brought about a very radical change, especially in the automobile industry. But adding value to the iron ore in Nigeria has been a problem. Uh, well, I won't go into the politics behind it, but that is one of the problems we have. We would have been able to do quite a lot, even as a nation. Next slide, please. 
if you look at um, the map of Nigeria, uh, you see that in every state, all over across the old, old, old nation, there is one type of raw material that is a major for each state. Every part of the country has different raw materials, but what we have now is that uh, foreigners come in, uh, collude with a few people in the locality, mine our uh, raw materials and ship it out. Nigeria is not taking, getting the benefit of it. Uh, next slide, please. Next slide. So the Nigerian mining sector, uh, please can you come back one step? Please come back one, yes. The Nigerian mining sector is divided majorly into three, uh, the upstream, the exploration and the mining, which is uh, where most of, um, of the stakeholders focus on. In the petroleum industry, you have a lot of companies coming in to take the crude without adding value to it. Meat processing and the beneficiation, very few uh, players are in the mainstream. In the downstream marketing and transportation, on petroleum, we have the crude. We still import um, the, the refined petroleum. Only the upstream and the downstream sectors are currently very active. The midstream, which is uh, the processing and beneficiation, you have very, very few players. And um, a lot of, even though we have a lot of policy and as any as an agency of government is looking at developing that midstream sector. Um, can we look at the next slide so that, um, next slide please. Next slide please. Wish I could. So if you look at if you look at um, the GDP from please this is not my next slide please can you move forward please hello yes I have three three more minutes I'll be done before then uh, so the seven priority. Um, uh, priority uh, areas in the mining sector. Number one is the iron or its metallic, which will have been uh, about 77%. Uh, 77. Then we have gold, limestone, barite, bitumen uh, from the petroleum uh, sector, coal, lead, and zinc, and a few others. Next slide. It's taking time. Okay. Next, please. Next slide. Next slide, please. So that I round up on time. Next slide. Yes. Okay. So this is what I'm trying to currently um, crude oil, especially petroleum and natural gas, um, takes the larger share of uh, the Nigerian uh, mining sector. Uh, if you look at uh, crude taking about 6.69% of the entire uh, GDP, and if you look at the quarrying and other minerals, it's just uh, less, less than 5.5% uh, uh, of the total. Uh, we are looking at um, making a difference in this. That's why currently Naseni has two institutes, uh, Solid Minerals Equipment and Development Institute, which is supposed to uh, develop technologies for beneficiating uh, these um, raw materials. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide, please. Next. Okay. The objective of uh, the downstream policies in Nigeria mining sectors uh, is number one, to move from the extractive, which is commodity-based economy, to a manufacturing-based economy. That is, we will use our raw materials 
and then to prioritize the downstream, downstream value addition. Next slide, please. I'm looking at my time. Next. Okay, stop. So these are some of the, uh, please come back. Let me round up um, on that slide before the reference. Okay, so we have regulatory framework. Uh, we have the executive order five. Uh, we have the petroleum industrial bill. Executive order five actually talks about um, using local technology to develop local things. I talked about the establishment of the Solid Minerals and Machinery Develop Development Institute, which is under NACENI. Uh, we already have two of these and we are make, uh, establishing more to develop the downstream uh, sector uh, and beneficiating uh, solid minerals in Nigeria to avoid uh, just taking away the raw materials. Thank you. Sorry for uh, the the way it is done. Uh, I'm sure uh, Professor, as soon as he comes out, he would get across and uh, he will join you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, uh, Engineer Emmanuel. Thank you for stepping in for uh, Professor Muhammad. I uh, appreciate the presentation and the disclosure of the strategies adopted by Nigeria, uh, the interest towards going further downstream uh, and being more uh, internally dependent in terms of um, creating new growth opportunities in having greater mastery of your natural resources in the form of uh, minerals and others as well. So, well, in the conclusion of your presentation, um, to add value to the session and to, to respond to the mission statement of why we are congregating this evening, this is to look into um, to, to how, how we can further uh, collaborate between countries that are participating, uh, participating this evening to, 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 to respond to that, to that clarion call. Um, the engaged material development for the tropics. So question number one, I would like to, to throw this to Dr. Annabella. Your, your, your presentation is, is cent uh, have been centered around the opportunities surrounding biomass. But during your, your I mean, in, in the course of your effort to, towards pushing, uh, pushing your, your biomass-based industry in, in the Philippines, uh, what have been the key challenges in pushing uh, those material, biomass material further downstream uh, in, in the Philippines, and what were the internal and external factors? Uh, are, you, are you looking at, at both uh, both both factors uh, interplaying at the same time, or are they mutually exclusive? What, what would you what would be your response to this? What are the key challenges here? Yeah. Maybe you need to unmute your. your uh, yeah, I have to unmute. Uh, yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay, thank you, Doctor Rizal, for the right. for the question. So the key challenges that uh, uh, we we encounter in pushing the lead uh, leading edge materials, uh, I'm speaking on the the manufacturing sector. So mm -hmm. this would be the the shifting the, the, the shifting to high value added activities. Mm -hmm. So and then one uh, challenges also is to creating a manufacturing innovation ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And then also the low R and D investments. You know? So, so with that, we know that R and D is uh, vital for uh, uh, businesses because it provides uh, powerful knowledge and insights. Mm -hmm. And then manufacturing companies uh, operate from a very highly competitive uh, perspective. So they compete globally in new products, uh, production technologies, new materials. And also the legislative or organizational and developing business models. So they they rely on innovation only to cope up with the uh, uh, competition. So these are all internal, but uh, and also for the external because of the global uh, competitive uh, of the uh, new technologies coming in also. So those are some of the key challenges in pushing the uh, uh, of the downstreaming of this uh, uh, biomass materials. But the government is the, uh, doing some uh, efforts of the 
uh, shifting to high value added uh, activities and then also investing in up upstream or or course sectors in linking and integrating manufacturing with agriculture and service industries for that but how, how do you how do you get the the, the the industry the private sectors to be interested in, in adopting because at the end of the day uh, the private sectors or the industry they always look at bottom line okay. meaning that yeah how can they make money in the immediate term rather than going for the long term uh, because technology carries risk right going downstream requires technological innovation intervention and so how as for wearing the government hat uh, as you are representing uh, the yes. how do you so, get them interested yeah okay so i i am from i work from the department of science and technology and yeah. so we really also do research and development so that's why i was uh, uh, I, I mentioned a while ago, uh, one of the challenges is the low R&D uh, investment. But now at the, our Department of Science and Technology, we, we invest in our Science for Change program. This was to accelerate mm -hmm. okay. science and technology uh, innovation in the country to keep up with mm -hmm. the developments in technology and innovation uh, are game changers. So this is... Okay. A, so this is in uh, for the industry to go into R and D and collaborate with the academe and also the oh, research uh, development institutes also. So it's one of so enticing them, and then we also have our need centers in the regions for uh -huh. research and development. Also, this is also for the uh, industries uh -huh. and okay. a collaborative research and development also uh, another program to leverage uh philippine economy so this is a synergistic uh, uh academe industry relationship you not know, to invigorate the philippines r d okay. and with some uh some also uh financial uh support from the government our okay. setup and start up wow so so if, uh if I mean, I can, I can summarize that the Philippines is very serious in, in, in pushing the innovation agenda to ensure that uh, there is life beyond the obvious, right? All this biomass accumulated, you know, being wasted can be converted into high value added activities to ensure that you can create new jobs, new business opportunities and uh, business development um, uh, opportunities for, for the industry to grow. Not just for, for the for the local market, but going regional and international as well. Thank you for that. And that brings me to to, to the next question, which I want to direct to Professor Nuro Tafiko, huh? because um, the fact that you came back from Japan, uh, you 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 answered that, that 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 national duty, the call of national duty to serve the nation, and to bring more value to Indonesian economy. But uh, the fact that you also represent the private sector because Nanotech Center in Indonesia is primarily uh, private sector driven. I mean, I stand guided by the, by, by the actual fact. Um, but how do you see from that angle, the private sector taking a proactive initiative, assisting the government uh, to, 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 to push the, the downstream agenda um, in, in, in your perspective, huh? uh, getting the nanotechnology component to create new value into Indonesia pre-existing sectors. But the one that you presented earlier on is in food sector, healthcare sector. But from the private sector, what are the, the, the steps you have taken that you can share with us so that we can understand how we can adopt this model across the tropical belt countries well, for something for us to learn from? Professor Nuru? Okay, uh, thank you for the question. Uh, I think uh, Indonesian government is very, very serious for uh, 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 put the agenda to increase uh, capability of uh, R&D. Yeah? They put uh, now we have bring uh, new uh, new agency. Uh, now you know my institute, the Nusan Institute of Sciences and Agency of uh, um, BBPT and others now uh, join together uh, with the new name of BRIN. This is how serious our country to uh, want to, uh, to uh, you know, uh, to uh, make a focus for R&D to bring the research industry. 
uh, as I presented uh, before that uh, we are so uh, with abundant of natural resources and for me uh, I'm because, because uh, me is uh, I also the researchers I also uh, by, 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 by crazy because I'm uh, now a chairman of uh, head of the Center for uh, Metallurgy and Materials in in, in Brin. I mean, in in our uh, in uh, Indonesian government, uh, because I have so many uh, research result uh, 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 registered with patent, and this is my duty to bring this uh, uh, you know patent to to industry to industry yeah, to commercialize my even uh, Indonesia I think still trying to find the government trying to find the model which is suitable to bring this uh, many many result uh, uh, giving added value for natural resources but you know the legal regulatory regulation regulation still not not enough to bring it uh, easily smoothly to the uh, you know uh, to, to the commercial states commercialization states the business states so uh, this is still struggle, I think, our Indonesian government. Uh, for me, uh, because uh, maybe I uh, a little bit, uh, you know, the uh, this uh, natural resources we have so many, and now we're trying to find uh, a significant added value. So we focus on uh, materials, uh, technology, te uh, then the beauty technology. So just. Uh -huh. Yes, making some uh, nanomaterials, nanoparticles, herbal nanoparticles, so we can uh, insert it in this uh, traditional, you know, product. Then we can get the, you know, benefit a lot. Uh, just, uh, uh, you know, insert the uh, nanotechnology with our natural resources, uh, nanoparticles. So for this reason, yes, uh, I focus on that. And now we have several startup making money uh, a lot <laughs> for this and mm, that's good. <laughs> uh, yes, this is uh, really this is just um, private uh, my opinion because uh, uh, making business with minerals we, we have also uh, abundance of uh, minerals uh, na natural resources of minerals but uh, for uh, you know uh, bring this uh, mineral we have uh, so many patents also for this but bringing this to the business uh, need so many effort, uh, money, uh, capital, and other others. And however, for, how, how do you get how how do you get the government to 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 put in money in the right places? Because because yeah. you're also wearing the hat of the private sector for for through uh, multiple yeah. outfits. This how, is how do you get the government to to believe in you? Yeah, uh, the government will believe us if we got the good result. Um, mm -hmm. give some example now you know uh, our company going to IPO uh, initial public offering uh, now center yeah. now it's already uh, now we are a public limited uh, company already uh, maybe within two or three uh, months uh, it will be IPO uh, uh, so uh, in that case maybe a government uh, all of Indonesian people see what our uh, what we already done <laughs> and then they can uh, maybe uh, you know uh, um, uh, believe or maybe use our our pet our pet how to uh, technology transfer from lab to industry they maybe uh, learn more and it become the guide uh, for the researcher to bring their result, result to industry, I think uh, okay. we still need need time. <laughs> we we yeah, make I understand. Our, because, we, we we make our yeah, pet. Because the capital <laughs> investment is huge, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I understand. Uh, appreciate your your response, but I want to go back to Mr. Eugene, eh? because um, not to put you in a box, <laughs> but uh, you're probably not the you're the only architecture in this group, and. Uh, you're not an engineer nor a scientist, but having listened to the value proposition coming from Dr. Annabelle, uh, Professor Nurul, as such, um, their experience in, in getting the, the, the private sector, the government to come on board, eh, to, to create that, that new path towards uh, innovative solutions um, um, underpinned by 
local resources. So from, from your perspective as an architecture who has vast experience in bamboo, so how do you see yourself positioning your industry interfacing with these new opportunities of which we can uh, create added value to bamboo? So how do you, you, you position yourself to become relevant in this innovation, technological, disruptive era? being such a new material in the field mm -hmm. um, i think the the main hurdles for us to get it even even in construction yeah. into construction is compliance right acceptance and compliance still mm -hmm. for for let's say in malaysian context for a, a, a dbkl officer to mm -hmm. try to approve your plans of a bamboo house is yeah. like at this stage almost impossible <laughs> never okay. before. There's no standard, uh, Malaysian standard for bamboo, right? Mm -hmm. Only new yeah. world standards for bamboo that are developing three or four standards. Yeah. So it's very new and it's almost pioneering. So how do you then persuade someone in in the government to approve mm -hmm. it? What we do is we we follow precedent. We follow countries that are ahead of us. Right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, we go to places like South America. Uh, even uh, Vietnam, even the Philippines is ahead of Malaysia in a sense. Um, I have projects in Malaysia that are about to start up that uh, I have to then even bring the right people for tours to Bali to show mm -hmm. them uh, buildings to say, hey, this is a six-story six building that's being built in bamboo. Right? Uh, we, are, we are not even asking for that. We are asking you to approve a two-story building in bamboo. Um, and here are the tests, here are the fire tests, here are the structural tests. Um, so it's convincing in, in a very basic way to say that it's been done before mm -hmm. uh, to get over that hurdle. Um, yeah. Build it and get it approved. <laughs> Almost, right? So, so, so that is like the the, 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 the the core of your current current uh, initiative, right? Just to get it accepted. Yeah. Yes. I mean, the other point also is that bamboo being bamboo, um, if you do not design it correctly, uh, water gets to it, sun gets to it, it can rot. Mm -hmm. If you do not treat it correctly, insects mm -hmm. come and have a party inside and eat up all the, <laughs> all the, all the stuff, right? Yeah. And have a great feast. Um, what is also needed from scientists like yourselves is looking into how to coat bamboo to protect it to create this, ah, okay. possibly a nano coating um it's been talked about for six seven years already maybe eight years but mm. we have not seen one on the market yet uh, eventually <laughs> when that comes in that will be someone smiling <laughs> um, yeah yeah that will be a game changer for many yeah. many bamboo people yeah uh, mm. So, I'm so, happy yeah. that you're able to connect, huh, Mr. Eugene. I mean, uh, you are smart as smart can get. So you have triggered that 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 uh, conversation opportunity for Dr. Annabelle because she, she she smiled first. Um, yes. Why don't you respond to that before I jump over to uh, Engineer Emmanuel? For, yeah. can, you, can you respond to that? Yeah. You okay. smile first. Go ahead. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, so I'm happy to learn because uh, we have our Forest Products uh, Research Institute, which is also under the Department of Science and Technology. And they also have a program on the bamboo. And one of their uh, R&D is also on that, uh, developing a coating for the, uh, not only for bamboo, but other uh, wood uh, furnitures for, for, to protect the uh, wetting and uh, uh, oxidation and uh, heat, no? and then uh, we also have a program on bamboo also for a big program uh, under the, our uh, Philippine Textile Research Institute for going uh, bamboo textile also yeah. and uh, microfibrillation cellulose also mm -hmm. using yeah. bamboo. So we are on the same <laughs> we yeah. have also bamboos in philippines and i think there's also a move to i think they are already developing a a, a shorter bamboo not the, the longer <laughs> other uh, variants of bamboo <laughs> so, well, so interesting yeah, yeah. go ahead uh, mr Yuzin. yeah yeah 
Um, yeah, just just a bit more about bamboo. I think in terms of it as a material, it is just at the starting line. It's re-emerging, and, and especially countries like Philippines, there's a is really a hotbed now. It's a hotbed for bamboo. So much interest, uh, many many inquiries of people wanting to learn how to design in bamboo. For me, as well, most of my students are Filipino. Universities come and ask and say, "Hey, I want you to run a class." Uh, for 10 of my, my staff, not even my students, my staff, right, so that they can teach. So this thing is going to grow exponentially, I think, especially in the, the design and construction field. And I think there are parallels in all the other fields that you mentioned as well. Yeah. I think this is what we call an enabler, where, where with the solution coming from Dr. Annabelle, even, even I'm sure Professor Nurul as well, I mean, in Indonesia, you have best experience in this nanocoating nano technology which will yeah. enable uh, those impediments, how do I say, to overcome those barriers, right? Okay, yeah. that. And, and whatnot, we'll have a party, then we have nanotechnology to prevent them from having parties, <laughs> such. <laughs> yeah. Interesting, yeah. And I think uh, we, I would like to, to, to get uh, Mr. Um, Engineer Emmanuel uh, involved. And the last uh, portion of your, your, your presentation, you, you mentioned about the strategy to make an outreach to friendly economies for collaboration to assist Nigeria uh, to go downstream and have greater control over high value pro uh, process of your natural resources. So can you expound or expand on that so that it will allow us uh, opportunities for the other speakers to see, hey, maybe we can participate in that. Maybe we have the technology to support Nigeria uh, high value ambition. Over to you, Mr. Emmanuel. Okay, uh, thank you very much. Um, I quite um, enjoy the discussion and um, I can already see a lot of uh, possibility for collaboration to do things together. Um, I can see a lot of strengths uh, uh, even in this small group that um, can work together for all of us. Um, in the area of um, getting other countries to support um, the project of Nigeria uh, towards uh, adding value to our natural resources. We've been doing that uh, and actually uh, the essence of the Nigerian government establishing uh, NASENI, the National Agency for Science and Engineering Infrastructure. So okay. uh, what we do is that uh, if there's any technology anywhere in the world that is needed in Nigeria to assist the economy, it is the duty of Naseni to go out there, look for it, and bring the technology home. So um, we've been working with uh, several countries, uh, with China, yes. Uh, with Indonesia, I was uh, um, uh, Dr. N uh, Professor Nura, uh, when uh, Indonesia in 2012, uh, I was at BPPT um, and a few other uh, agencies of government and private sector to look at uh, their processes. Uh, I was at uh, PT Bindad. Uh, we looked at uh, how to uh, look at uh, the technology of uh, producing uh, even armored vehicles, uh, uh, talking about uh, the aircraft production, rifles and all that we were there um, so we actually collaborate and i uh, very soon because we've start, we've opened a, a discussion with your ambassador in nigeria uh, to actually uh, get the two our two presidents to sign the mou so that we can work together on that so we are doing that uh, with china uh, two years ago we actually um trained about 60 of our engineers on uh, the, the production of uh, transformers. Uh, talking, um, coming back to mineral resources, Nigeria, especially our, one of our northern states called Castina, has the best silica uh, um, in the world, which is what is used in the silicon industry. But we are not adding value to it. But uh, we've um, we are working with uh, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, one of the Chinese companies, uh, CGWIC, World Industrial Corporation, 
uh, on how to extract silicon, produce silicon ingots, and from silicon ingots, uh, to uh, slice them into wafers, which is used uh, for solar cells. Currently, we are producing solar panels, solar models, but we import, we still import uh, the solar cells. But once that project is done, uh, we are going to be producing solar cells for the rest of uh, Africa. Uh, and uh, I'm sure we'll be able to work with several of you. Um, for, uh, uh, do I call you Dr. Eugene? Um, on the issue of uh, nanotechnology coating um, for the bamboo, uh, we've been working uh, with some research groups on uh, looking at uh, bamboo, uh, studying the bamboo, the strength in the, uh, in the lateral uh, uh, for mimetics uh, research. Uh, we also have a very strong uh, uh, nanotechnology uh, research group here. So if you're interested, we could actually talk about uh, those uh, coatings. Uh, we could look at uh, carbon, we could also look at carbon nanotube. Uh, uh, the research in carbon nanotubes is not well pronounced, but is one hell of a strong material, very light, but uh, when you uh, produce uh, coatings with carb carbon nanotubes, it actually increases the strength. And uh, uh, we, we've used that for a lot, a lot of things. So we could actually talk uh, about that if you're interested. And we could set up maybe a small group to work on uh, what you have in mind. Thank you very much. Wow, I think I think, uh, Mr. Eugene, you're like the like the lightning rod here. Everyone is like pitching uh, to you. <laughs> you're like you represent the downstream application of what what the industry wants, and we have here three suitors who are able to say, "Hey, I have A, I have B, I have C," and you're spot for choices. I think this is what I think the the objective of this session is to to look at collaboration between countries, understanding how we can push downstream. And Eugene, the your participation here is is it's priceless because you, you, you probably said that I want A, I want B, I want C. And people like Dr. Annabelle and Engineer Emmanuel say, hey, I have what you need. <laughs> and I think to, 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 to summarize this, um, I, think, um, I think we're running out of time. Uh, we are hitting the, the, um, the 10 p.m. mark here. So I would like to express my, 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 my utmost gratitude to Professor Nuro Taufik for participating for Indonesia. Dr. Annabelle, uh, my colleague uh, from at Asian Nano Forum. So right now we're both a uh, vice president of that uh, so-called Asian-wide uh, association. And of course, Mr. Emmanuel and Mr. Eugene for your much valued contribution to this session. And I hope that whatever that we have discussed here will translate into something which is real, an example of how when economies, friendly economies, huh, that's critical. The word is friendly economies here can collaborate without the exploitation agenda, because any collaboration here must be at parity of which all partners are on equal footing. If you come in, you add value to both economies and there is a mutual technology transfer and mutual utilization of what is, can be developed together. So that what is meant by our, our so-called vision and mission statement towards creating that leading edge material so that people like us in the tropical belt can also be in a leading edge economy. And we can be able to uh, redefine the global supply chain to ensure that whatever the high value added activities can be retained in the tropical belt. So with that, I also would like to express my thanks to the organizer, um, the Mahadi Science Award, Academy Science of Malaysia for getting me on board as a moderator. So with that, I conclude the session. Thank you, everyone. Um, have a restful evening and to our friend uh, Emmanuel I think Nigeria you're still uh, daytime over there uh, have a nice day stay safe everyone hopefully we can meet physically at some point in the future thank you so much bye-bye thank you thank, thank you bye-bye bye-bye thank, thank you very much to all the panelists for their insight and inputs we have come to the end of the second day of the conference we hope everyone has gained new knowledge and insights and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Thank you and have a good day.